Tena Koto Katoa, Ko Castle Hill Te Maunga, Ko Beldenbrook Te Awa, No Ingarangi Ahau, KWWF Ahau e Mahiana, Ko Lucy Toku Ingoa, No Rera, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Katoa. That's a very hard act to follow, Aroha. <laughs> So thank you. That was deep and uh, incredibly interesting. And now we're going to just raise it up to talk about boring policy. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming here today, especially to those who have traveled and taken time out, as um, others have said, of your everyday jobs to be here. And to those, if there is anybody online, uh, thanks for watching. And I just want to say a huge thank you to the Department of Conservation, um, our partners in bringing this event together. It's just been amazing working with you and it certainly wouldn't have happened without you. Now, I've just got five minutes to explain the global policy perspective on climate and ocean, so I'm going to head straight into it. <laughs> um, I'd like to draw your attention to some significant reports that have come out over the last couple of years. So these include the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on Ocean and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate, um, and also the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Global Assessment Report that came out in 2019. Um, these are both highly robust, collaborative, and extremely influential reports, and they paint a very gloomy picture of the impacts of climate change that are locked in for decades to come and that we're already experiencing, and of the fact that our biodiversity is declining at a rate higher than ever before, with one million species currently threatened with extinction. Hot off the press also literally about four days ago um, is this um, combined IPBES and IPCC um, workshop report on biodiversity and climate change. So I recommend you all go and have a look at that. Um, now these reports make it clear that we need to integrate how we think about and manage our ocean with respect to the climate and biodiversity crises that we're facing. So that brings me to another report that just came out last week from WWF. Um, there's a copy on the reception desk for those that are interested and I can send you a digital copy too. Um, the aim of this report is to provide practical guidance to countries and partners on how to leverage specific mechanisms within and across relevant global frameworks with a strong focus on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. There are four key principles that you can see up on the screen here, um, but we really hope that this will help to bring together how we address um, the biodiversity crisis through our climate change targets. So this year, 2021, is dubbed the Ocean Super Year by us and by many others. It was actually supposed to be 2020, but it got postponed. Um, and that's because of the many significant global events and negotiations that are going on at the moment. Um, so WWF has just signed an Ocean Super Year declaration that's been put out by the World Economic Forum and Friends of Ocean Action. And it basically calls for strong action across all of these um, negotiations. <clears throat> so these include um, the Climate COP26, which is taking place in Glasgow in November. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Also the UN Biodiversity COP, which is the 15th COP taking place in Kunming in China in October. Now this is where we're expecting to um, have a new global biodiversity framework agreed upon. So that will replace the 2011 to 2020 targets, also known as the AICHI targets. So there's a whole range of targets there, one of which was to protect effectively 10% of our ocean by 2020. And that's also one of the sustainable development goals under target 14, which is all about life beneath the ocean. Now that's a target that we have failed to meet locally and globally, despite the urgency and the scale of the threats facing us. Um, and also, of course, now scientists are recommending that 10% is nowhere near enough. We need to be aiming for 30% or more. Um, the UN Decade of Ocean Science is launching this year as well, and it actually just launched in Aotearoa last week on World Ocean Day. This is a significant opportunity to bring people together and address some of those key knowledge gaps that we have. Negotiations are also underway for a global ocean treaty. This is about how we conserve and sustainably use areas um, beyond our national jurisdiction, so in the high seas. So that's known as the BBNJ negotiations. They've been going on for a number of years and they have four cross cutting or four themes, some of them cross cutting, which include area based management tools and marine protection of those high seas areas. So I'm just going to go back to the significance of the climate COP coming up soon. The previous climate COP was known by some as the Blue COP, and that took place in Madrid in 2019. Um, 
there were around actually 90 ocean related events that happened on the fringes of the COP. Um, but the significant thing is that for the first time ever, an ocean section found its way into the COP decision text. And that was that the COP called for a dialogue to be convened on the ocean and climate change. So that took place in December and there's an informal report that's available online. Um, there's still decisions to be made about what happens with that report, but it's actually a really useful um, kind of summary of the issues with some very powerful key messages. And I've put some of them up on the screen here. To date, the ocean has been a critical buffer against climate change, but tipping points are being reached and ocean risk is increasing. Protecting and restoring nature is fundamental for resilience, but action requires the participation of all voices. So um, there is a meeting of the presidencies of COP25 and COP26 later this month, and they'll be exchanging views on the next steps with this informal report from the dialogue. Our hope is for agreement on a process or program to integrate the ocean into the UNFCCC global climate agenda. So I just want to end with a quote from John Tanza, who's our ocean practice lead for WWF. The centrality of the ocean has never been clearer and awareness has never been greater. From the UN SDGs, the climate cops, to boardrooms, to banks, the ocean seems to be the glue across many frameworks for action. But we need to keep people at the center of all our thinking and action and acknowledge the role that communities, particularly indigenous communities play in protecting our ocean and our land and the fact that they're disproportionately affected by these crises facing us. Going back to the outcome of the ocean climate dialogue, action requires the participation of all voices. And so we're really happy to have so many voices in the room today. And we hope that together we can agree upon some recommendations for building resilience into our ocean. At the end of the day, I think we all want the same thing. We want a better future for our children. And I couldn't resist without ending with a picture of my beautiful daughter, <laughs> who's already an ocean warrior at age six. It's great to bring our children into the, the discussion because that's what really drives us, I think, in, in what we do. So yeah, happy to answer any questions if there's time, but thank you again. And I'm looking forward to some great discussions today.